for our first session today, let's welcome William Bayliss, Assessment Solutions Consultant at the British Council. Good morning, everybody in South America. Good evening, everybody here in Asia. Welcome to my session, Investigating Scale Length and Inter-Rater Reliability in Auto-Rated Assessment. All right, the stage is yours, William. Hi, everyone. Uh, for the past two years, my colleagues, Trevor Breakspear, Jan Langerschlag, and myself, have been working with the IELTS partners on the IELTS Smart Learning ISO application. This AI-powered low-stakes assessment application aims to give fine-grained feedback to middle and high school students in China to help them improve their spoken English. Today's session will zoom in on the initial phase of developing a task for ISIL, which taps into elements of the IELTS speaking test part one and part two construct. For this task, we developed a mechanism to collect human ratings that will eventually train a machine rater. This iterative process involved a 13 band scale and a seven band scale for rating which produced some interesting data. I saw this data as a rare opportunity to compare scale lengths. The analysis of this data is the focus of my talk today. This session will discuss the following research questions. Are there acceptable levels of inter-rater reliability for low stakes auto-rated assessment? How does inter-rater reliability in a 12 band scale compare to a seven band scale. To help frame what's to follow, it's important to be very clear about what is meant by the terms low stakes and high stakes and inter-rater reliability. Let's look at each of these in turn and then discuss scale length. Let's look at stakes, high and low first. According to these definitions from Bachman and Palmer, the key differences are those of impact of decisions made and the ease with which the decisions can be reversed. High stakes, high impact decisions that are hard to reverse, low stakes, low impact decisions that can easily be reversed. Next, let's define inter-rater reliability. Anderson, Clapham and Wall define it as the degree of similarity between different examiners. In short, can two or more examiners without influencing one another give the same marks to the same set of scripts or oral performances? Through the lens of today's workshop, these definitions of high stakes and low stakes decisions and inter-rater reliability raise some interesting questions. How do levels of rater scrutiny differ between a low stakes AI assessment app like ISIL and other assessment types? What impact do the decisions made by the machine rater have on users of the app? How easily can ISIL machine, the ISIL machine rater uh, Rater's decisions be reversed, and what steps did we take to maximize inter rater reliability? Let's address the first three questions first. The machine is only as good as its training data, and obviously, we want the machine to perform as well as possible. Although the decisions made by ISO are low impact, the machine leveraged by the app has the potential to make a huge number of decisions for a huge number of students. Therefore, combined, these decisions will likely have relatively high impact on teachers, students, parents, curriculum, and schools. Although individual decisions made by ISO can easily be reversed, long-term use of the app could lead to, lead to positive or negative washback. For example, changes in users' learning behavior, language use, or curriculum. This would be harder to reverse. The implication of these factors are that the performance of the engine is paramount, and this accounts for the higher than normal levels of scrutiny placed on the data and, by implication, the raters who created that data. Let's look at the measures that we took to maximize reliability. 
There is an abundance of guidance in the literature for best practices that aim to improve integrated reliability. For example, Anderson, Clapham and Wall and Nock, Fairburn and Jim. Uh, an in-depth discussion of this guidance is beyond the scope of this presentation. I would, however, like to highlight some key strategies we deployed that in some cases went well beyond the requirements for even high stakes testing. Our raters were divided into six teams of three. All recordings were at least double marked. The majority were triple marked and some were even marked by the entire cohort. Our monitoring system sampled every rating from uh, for man, man, uh, many facets rash measurement, known as MFRM. This process continued throughout the project, allowing us to highlight problem areas to raters to help them improve. The rating scales performance was monitored and was revised as necessary, and the raters were retrained and re-standardized whenever it was deemed necessary to tighten levels of reliability. Now, I would like to talk about the scales that we used in more detail. Why would we want to attempt a rating scale with 13 bands? That's a lot of bands. The IELTS smart learning application is designed to measure progress over time and tease out small differences in performance. For this, it needs granularity. The chosen scale length came down to a compromise between what's reliable and the level of granularity. An analytic rather than holistic scale was also implemented as analytic scales highlight more performance features to the raters and provide fine grained feedback to learners. It was decided that the payoff from a 13 band five criteria scale made it worth attempting even though this goes against the received wisdom, summed up by Miller's dictum of seven plus or minus two. 12, 13 is uh, a lot more than the usual maximum of nine. Here's a mock-up of the scale that we used. Due to the confidential nature of the band script, as I can't share the full documents here today, as you can see from this slide, the even bands contained the rich descriptors of each level uh, and criteria. The odd bands existed as intermediates between the even bands. Why did we reject 13? On the slide, you can see the rationale provided by Trevor Breakspear, my colleague for the ISL team's decision to collapse the scale to seven bands. Initial analysis indicated that internal consistency was too low to train our tech partner, iFlyTech's evaluation engines. The reason for this lower reliability may lie in the high cognitive load exerted on the rater by the 13 band five criteria scale. In short, granularity is no use if the data isn't reliable enough. Now let's have a look at the seven band scale. Why did we choose to reduce the scale to seven bands? Well, um, in another stream of ISIL, the placement test, we had a lot of success with seven bands. Also, uh, collapsing the scale was simply a case of removing the intermediate bands from the 13 band scale. The raters already had experience with the, the descriptors from the 13 band scale, so the retraining for the new scale was minimal. As you can see, we have just removed the intermediate bands. As I stated in my introduction, the data collected on both scale lengths is a rare opportunity to compare the scales. For this analysis, I selected the data that involves the fewest independent variables so that analysis would give the clearest possible indication of differences between a seven and a 12 band scale. The initial batches used the 13 band scale batches three onwards use the seven band scale. I only selected data for this analysis from batches one to four as I didn't want the seven band scale analysis to have more data than the 13 band analysis. This slide shows a table of all data sets that were rated in batches one to four and by whom. The four colors represent samples where data set, prompt and IELTS part were the same. 
The pairs, yellow, orange, and green, blue, differ only in scale length and data sets, so are the strongest groupings for comparisons to be made. Because the IELTS tasks and prompts are different between groups two and three and five and six, any comparisons need to be made with caution. Groups two and three comprised of six raters for both batches, and groups five and six comprised of five raters for both batches. The analysis I will share with you was run with multifacet rash measurement, MFRM, using the Minifac software program. The rationale for this was that MRFM may reveal rating patterns that other indices may not, and it's also very powerful in the examination of rater scale function. There are a lot of other useful measures provided by rash, but they are beyond the scope of today's presentation. The following slides first describe the results of the relatively crude agreement indices, exact agreement, and then the much more nuanced probability curves. In terms of guidance from the literature, uh, Nock, Fairburn and Jin explain that although many textbooks set the acceptable levels of exact agreement at 80%, in reality, the levels usually fall between 40 and 60%. We can see then that the 13 band scale falls well below this, but with so many bands, we would expect this number to be lower than with a shorter scale. For the seven band scale, we can see the levels of exact agreement are well within the suggested tolerances. The next element of MFRM requires some explanation. Uh, this element of the presentation is quite technical. The important thing isn't to try and understand the minutiae of the mathematical model, it's to understand their implications regarding the scale. The probability curve is a graphical representation of the statistics produced by MFRM. Combined with various category statistics, scale performance can be analysed in detail. This slide shows a probability curve for a well-functioning four-category rating scale that comes from Bond and Box. Let's break it down. The most important element of rash analysis is to understand what makes up the x-axis on this graph. Simply put, it represents a measuring stick for difficulty and ability. It's a ruler to measure difficulty and ability. The scale is in logits. This is a clever mathematical way of saying an equal interval ruler with a midpoint at zero. This type of analysis assumes that difficulty of being awarded a band score correlates perfectly with the ability of a test taker. This is how it can be reduced to a single axis, a single ruler. The y-axis is the probability from zero to one, zero to 100 percent. Each individual number represents the probability of getting that score at that level of ability or difficulty. So where the two lines intersect is the point where one score becomes less likely than the next. In this example, all four bands of the rating scale are discriminating well. So as we move from left to right, you can see it gets less likely that a person gets a one, more likely they'll get a two, less likely they get a two, more likely they'll get a three as their ability increases as we would expect. The statistics displayed in the probability curves can also be displayed as numbers and can provide further illustration of scale function. I would like to discuss three of them. The first is counts. That essentially means that for each of the bands, we need enough data to be able to use this statistical tool. Less than 10 is not enough. Average measures, what we expect a ruler to progress in number order. You expect it to go from one, to one, two, three, four, five, not one, five, three, two. And then threshold measures. Again, we expect the bands to progress in number order, but also we expect that the bands are relatively evenly spaced. Again, like a ruler, you expect the distance between one and two to be similar to the distance between nine and 10. Here are the probability curves for batch two, a 13 band batch. As we can see, just by looking at the curves in comparison to the previous slide, we can see that there is poor discrimination between bands. 
In the table on the right, I've added another column, which I call the threshold measure gap. This is simply the difference between the threshold measures of adjacent bands. How wide are the notches on this ruler? Looking at counts, we can see that bands 2 and 11 are below the recommended threshold. This is at the extremes of the data. Usually data is normally distributed, so we always find that at the extremes there's not enough data. Average measures, uh, if we look at the average measure column, we can see that they don't always increase in number order. The measure for band three is lower than the measure for band two. However, this may be due to uh, band two not having a high enough count of responses for the estimation of threshold values. We can also see, uh, in terms of threshold value, that they're not in number order. We can also see that the gaps between thresholds bar one are below the accepted tolerance. These measures seem to indicate less measurement precision and therefore a greater chance of inappropriate scoring. Let's look at the second 13 band batch. Again, counts at the extremes are below the suggested threshold. In terms of average measures, we can see that bands 10 and 11 are out of number order. Both bands in this count, case have counts above the threshold of 10. In terms of threshold measure, I think this is the most interesting data that I found in my analysis. We can see that not all the threshold measures are in number order. If we look at the threshold measure gap, again, this is the, the space between the notches on the ruler, we can see that the bands alternate between being inside and outside the suggested thresholds. This suggests that either the rich descriptor, because remember the 13 band was built of rich descriptors and intermediate descriptors, uh, yeah, so either the rich descriptor or the intermediate descriptors are not functioning properly. So this would be a very interesting line of research, as many rating scales use these intermediate bands. Here are the probability curves for batch four. Now we're down to seven bands. And as you can see, the distinction between the bands is clear. And this suggests that just by eyeballing this graph, that the scales are performing well. In terms of counts, we can see some of the counts at the extremes are low. The average measures all increase in number order and the threshold measures increase in number order and the gaps are within accepted tolerances. Now let's look at the second batch, the second seven band batch. We can see that there are again low counts at the high extremes. The average measures increase monotonically. In terms of the threshold measures, um, they increase monotonically in the gaps within accepted tolerances, except for an outlier between bands two and three. I don't know how to account for this, as the counts are well within accepted tolerances, 44, 198, 245, so there's plenty of data. Uh, further investigation is needed into why this is happening. Let's go back to my research questions. Are there acceptable levels of inter-rater reliability for low stakes auto-rated assessment? Um, from this research, it's not possible to answer this question until the machine has been trained by the data and we validate its output. As I explained above, various strategies have been deployed to maximize reliability. How does inter-rater reliability in a 12 band scale compare to a seven band scale? Well, in as far as scale function is concerned, the data suggests that a seven band scale functions much better than the 13 band scale. We would expect more reliable, reliable rating from raters using the shortened scale. In conclusion, the claims made by the literature that point to longer scales having reduced reliability seem to be supported by this data. The data also supports the decision to collapse the scale from 13 to 7 bands. There's no such thing as a perfect scale, there are always trade-offs. As many have pointed out, scale type should match the purpose of the assessment. Developing scales is very expensive. It's possible that a 13 band scale could have been made to work or that a 9 band scale may have been a better compromise, but we didn't have the funds to explore this further. So what insights can this research give teachers and small scale assessors? 
Well, teachers often create rating scales for various educational purposes. They need to decide how many levels of discrimination are needed. This study and the bulk of literature suggest that the longer the scale and the more analytic criteria they have, then the process will be more resource intensive and less reliable. A balance needs to be struck between the levels of reliability demanded and the granularity of the ratings. In short, be very clear about what you want to measure and make sure the rating scale and the criteria are as simple as possible. There were some limitations of this study. The data was not collected to address the second research question. So the data similar enough to be compared is limited. More data is needed for stronger conclusions to be made. Collecting this data was very expensive and time consuming. So the scope for further 13 band data collection is unfortunately limited. There are some further research directions that are raised by, um, by this. All of the criteria data were analyzed together. It might be possible to run separate analysis for each individual criteria to see if some criteria perform better with more bands than others. Another study, study could look at the effect of a holistic scale with 12 and seven bands, looking at differences between the part one and part two prompts. Also, um, a distributed marking approach where each rater only marks for one criteria could be attempted on the 13 band scale, thereby reducing cognitive load, but unfortunately massively increasing cost because you would say for a five um, criteria scale, you would need five raters to rate one recording, uh, which would be very, very expensive indeed. The data from slide 22 suggests that there is an issue either with the criteria or intermediate bands. This was with the uh, seven band scale where one of the bands wasn't functioning properly. This would be a very interesting future line of research. Uh, here's my bibliography if people are interested in having a read. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my presentation today. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you, William. Let's see if we have any questions from the audience. All right, I'm checking the chat. Okay. In the meantime, I want to jump in and ask you about something that we were discussing yesterday in, in, in one of the sessions, and is the, um, the issue regarding authenticity. And, and we were discussing mainly the problems that we have um, about task engagement, fluency and coherence, uh, the fact that many students go online to read the prompts and sort of memorize answers, how would this 12 band deal with that in terms of what you have done so far in this research process, William? In terms of task engagement, um, so is your question, um, how would this deal with students who are trying to game the system? They're trying to yes. game the prompt. Yes. Um, well, because you have a human rater and because uh, these are, I don't know, it's quite difficult to answer that question. It, um, in terms of AI, which this is designed for, um, it's clear that a lot of AI systems have problems with students who are trying to game the system. Because if you have a question, say an IELTS part two question that is asking about some uh, a present that you had been bought by a friend and then the student goes on to answer a question that is completely unrelated to the prompt um it is possible because of the way that the ai measures the language that the ai might give quite a high score when the human wouldn't give a very high score but because what i was talking about today was uh talking about being rated by humans well, um, I can't go into the details of the band descriptors because they're confidential, but they're very similar to the uh, IELTS uh, band descriptors in terms of task. Right. So being a human rater, if using my previous example, the student was asked to answer a question about presence and then they started talking about a time when they went to play golf in Thailand, 
then obviously the human rater would be able to penalise them for doing that. All right, okay. But I don't know whether, um, the reason for my hesitation is, it's just, uh, it's a difficult question in terms of the difference between a seven band and a 13 band rating scale. I don't know if there would be that much more granular detail related to task that would help you to um, deal with students who are talking off topic. Yeah, because I was thinking perhaps getting, yeah, having more details, you know, when 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 in the process of 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 grading the students. Yeah. Uh, but well, let's 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 let let me read another question so so we can also, I mean, continue exploring it. Nick Zimmer is is asking, so fewer scaling divisions is deemed to more reliable? In terms of this research, yes, that seems to be what it demonstrates. And our guess, and it is a guess, is that it's due to cognitive load. If you just think about what a 12 band, five criteria rating matrix looks like, and you're listening to someone speaking and you have to try and process all of that matrix whilst listening to that person, compared to a much simpler scale that was say seven bands, over five criteria or even simpler if it was seven bands and holistically rated so it was one criteria you're only looking at seven boxes versus i mean uh, how many is that 13 times five my maths isn't very good um 50 15 65 yes yeah, so you've got to cover 65 boxes so um i would say yes it is deemed to be more reliable but unfortunately there's less granularity so going back to where all of this started, because we're training an AI, mm -hmm. um, the AI can deal with a huge matrix. It doesn't matter how big the matrix is. The problem is that you need that data to train the machine so that the machine can, uh, can rate across those criteria. So um, as I said at the end, it might be possible to do a distributed um, system where, yeah, you have, so for any one recording you have five examiners one examiner just for fc one examiner just for lr one examiner just for gra but it would be very very expensive although it would be super interesting if we were to do that and we got really good data to see whether or not the machine really can cope with that amount of granularity okay nick has a follow-up question what if within each scaling division descriptor was divided into a percentage range would there be much less re reliability? Um, I don't know. I don't know um, quite exactly what you mean by that, Nick, because um, as soon as you start talking about percentages in a rating scale, um, what do those percentages mean? Do those percentages speak to the ability of the um, student? Because if they speak to the ability of the student, you start get, getting into the realms of not having criteria in the rating scale. You're just saying, okay, so there's this person who's speaking English to me, rate them between 1% and 100%, how good you think their FC is, rather than doing it in a criteria-based way where you're saying, okay, so for each of these essentially arbitrary um, bands, what does each of those bands contain? So I would say that adding percentages to the scale would more like, only, and I'm only basing this on my experience as an examiner, I, I haven't seen any research into this, but I would assume that it would confuse the examiner because the examiner might start thinking in terms of, oh, how would I rate this person's English out of 100%? Rather than looking at the details in the criteria and saying, Okay, so for a band seven, we're looking for a student who does X, Y, and Z. Well, Nick is adding an example. He, he's mentioning, I don't know if you can see it in the, in the chat, of four scales. And then he uh, mentions that there is a descriptor for each of those bands. Right, I don't know. I haven't seen any um, research into um, using percentiles in the rating scale uh, instead of using numbers um yeah I, I i don't know and i'd be interested to uh, find out if anyone has had any experience with that okay we let's go for the last question jamie is asking 
uh, could you have a two-step approach, an initial decision that is brought to place a student on one part of a scale and then digging deeper to make granular decisions? That is something that I would love to try, only because, um, as I said, with training the machine, if we can get reliable detailed data that is across this very broad matrix, um, then it will be very interesting to see how the machine fares um, in terms of the human versus machine reliability. But unfortunately, in terms of this, um, because seven is so reliable, I think we just have to stick with the seven bands. Um, Nick is also adding a comment regarding learning management systems, and I think he's mentioning Blackboard. He says the LMS system BB, Blackboard, I believe, allows for these types of rubrics. Sorry, um, what is, is it Blackbird? Yeah, say? I believe BB stands for Blackboard. Blackboard. But maybe um, Nick could clarify to us. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Nick. Um, I've not heard of the LMS system or Blackboard. Um, I, when you say these types of rubrics, do you mean the percentage types of rubrics? Do you mean the um as jamie um pointed out that it's possible to have a, um one rater who gets the kind of ballpark area of the matrix and then another rater does a detailed uh analysis yeah it is blackbird but i'm waiting for uh, uh, an answer in the chat let's let's it is it is from blackbird but william you're saying that you're not familiar with this learning management system no, sorry, I'm not familiar with it, so um, I can't answer that question. But however, um, straight after this, I'll have a look uh, because that sounds very interesting. Yes, it is. Yeah. Although I believe in, um, um, at the university where I work, we're moving away from Blackbird because it's going to stop working. And, and now we're moving towards the use of Brightspace, where I guess we're going to have a similar training to understand the, the, the learning management system and how can we explore <laughs> This um this 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 thing of the uh, of the rubrics and and the scale and and the percentages that you can allow for 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 the criteria. Um, with those scales that it uses, um, um, who's using the scales? Is it humans that are um doing those ratings? Yes. Um, and does the system collect the human ratings and recordings of the users? Yes, yeah, we collect data and, and then there are like several options there in Blackboard. Oh, wow, Nick added that. We just got an updated version. So I guess that where where Nick is is working, they, they still use Blackboard. So I don't wanna I don't wanna continue mentioning anything else because for me where I work is different. We're gonna stop using Blackboard altogether. Right. Yeah, all righty. Um checking for any other questions, but um other than that, um it's time to finish this session and I am inviting everyone to stay or come back in five minutes to start our next presentation. William, thank you so much for your presentation. No problem at all. Thank you very much. Bye everyone.